How can you cut through the noise of, you know, how other folks are, you know, how they're marketing themselves. And like I said, it's not copying what everybody else is doing. You're not going to cut through the noise that way. You're just going to look like, uh, I'm going to use a phrase from, from the 90s. You're just going to look like a poser. Ooh. <laughs> Welcome to Too Legitimate to Quit, instantly actionable small business strategies with a pop culture spin. I am your host, Annie P. Ruggles, and my guest today is the brilliant and hilarious Kay Lane Crawford. Described by colleagues as the Meryl Streep of copywriting because they can shapeshift their writing for any brand, Kay Lane Crawford brings over a decade of advertising, media, and writing experience to the table. Lane has worked with Get this, an eclectic mix of clients from fashion labels geared toward preppy sorority girls to wine and spirit brands that target tough guys. They served as a script analyst reading terrible horror screenplays that never saw production, worked as a journalist for online entertainment magazines, and did time as a client representative where they helped D-list celebrities land gigs at Comic-Cons and bailed them out of jail. There's a note here. Put the coffee pot on. They have stories to tell. Born in Boston, although lost the accent, raised in New Hampshire and educated in Philadelphia, go birds, Lane is a proud University of the Arts graduate and a Drexel University MBA dropout. Although they have made Orlando, Florida their home since 2012, they still say they're from the Northeast. When they are not whipping up witticisms, you can find them searching for rare sneakers to add to their extensive collection, playing guitar and drums, and singing karaoke. Their go-to song is Alanis Morissette's You Oughta Know. Lane, what do small business owners need to focus on this week? This week, small business owners need to focus on what their copy is like, because I can tell you without even looking at it, most likely it probably sucks. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I mean, here's the thing. We're not trying to be mean, y'all, but there are a lot of copy people that have probably led you astray into some boring ass shit. Oh, 100%. A hundred percent. Without seeing it, you can assume it probably sucks. Tell me some of the ways that you see copy that just sucks. They think that they, whatever our audience that they're writing for, they feel like they have to be boring. Right now, I focus primarily just on law firms and folks would think, oh, that's probably boring. It's all the same. No, not at all. You can actually tailor your copy and have personality, even if you're in a, you know, a traditional, you know, white collar professional, you know, business environment, you can have that kind of personality. It's just, it's, it's learning how to do it properly. You know, it's not, you know, you're not going to be, you know, writing copy, like, you know, the Instagram page for Slim Jim or something ridiculous like that. I mean, obviously you have to know your audience, but you're, you can put in personality. Don't, don't shy away from personality and copy small businesses. I feel like a lot of people hear that word personality and assume that they have to then put on somebody else's personality in order to have personality. And I think that's so totally true. Like you have this huge specialty in legal. What you're not saying is you have to start your next email you send with what up, bitches? That's right. not what you're saying. There are a thousand degrees. Exactly. Dearest, dear so-and-so. It has been two months since our last correspondence. And what <laughs> a bitch? Like there is. But so you know what? You know what, Annie? I have I I've actually worked with a client that was like on, you know, not as what up bitches, but they were a divorce attorney and they had a lead magnet called So You Married an Asshole. So like, so you 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 know, you That's can perfect. create, you know, your own audience. You know, you don't have to be completely buttoned up. If you, if you want to attract certain clients and, you know, a certain audience, even if you're in a professional setting like law, 
you can still have that kind of edgy persona. It doesn't work for everybody, but it can work for some folks. Well, and in that perfect example, that cuts right to the mentality, Mm -hmm. right to the psychology of what that person's clients are going through. They're not thinking, oh, I really need to leave my my marriage. They're thinking my spouse is an asshole. Right. So a lead magnet's like, what to do if you married an asshole? Right. I'm lucky I didn't marry an asshole. If I had married an asshole, that would catch my eye in a sea of three ways to kick off your divorce litigations. Right. Blah. Yep. The boring stuff. The boring like stuff. nobody wants, especially if you're going through such an emotional time, such as, you know, a, you know, divorce, or even if you're talking like estate planning, you don't, I mean, it doesn't have to be, you know, so you're thinking about estate plan. Like it doesn't right. have to be, you know, boring. <laughs> It also doesn't have to be ambulance chasey, right? Like one of the main things that I had to specialize in early in my past marketing and branding life and now especially in sales is how pain points are handled. And that is the number one place where I think personality has to come through Yeah, because a lot of people are taught to agitate the problem in a way that makes the client the bad guy. That doesn't work, right? Mm -hmm. We got to get into their head. But at the same point, do you want to say, are you tired of emotional abuse in your marriage? That may be the right tone, but the tone may also be, is your spouse an asshole? Right. I always, we always, I always say with clients, it's like, you know, what is, you know, I, I always try to get, you know, a a basic personality kind of feel for it. And I always, you know, um, one of, you know, um, that I work with at legalese, we're always usually on the, the intake calls and like the questions that, you know, both he and I always ask is like, how, you know, how would you describe yourself? Are you more like, you know, Mr. Rogers here going to give you, you know, a cup of tea and tuck you in, or are you more of like, you know, smack you around not smack you around but like you know more cutting through the noise and you know if you know not afraid to you know take it to the next level that way Mm -hmm. um and we always you know judge and you know you'd be surprised you know with some folks that they would say you know yeah maybe I kind of want to try out you know being a little edgy or here and there and you know and I always test the waters you know even if it's a with a client that is more you know traditional I try to pepper in some of that, especially in, you know, the emails um, in, in, you know, just like in, you know, email intakes and things. I just always try to pepper in some of the stuff that can be a little edgy and like, see if, you know, if they, if they take the bite, you know, take the bait. Yeah. And most of the time they do. So it's like, okay, so now I'm doing, you know, I'm doing something, doing something right here. So you just, it's just, it's like baby steps with some clients. Yeah. And it's an experiment. Exactly. Like you just said, it's Goldilocks. Do I have to go all the way into Papa Bear sass? Right. Or can I can I dip the toe? Can I mm-hmm. pedal in? And yeah. and I think a lot of it is personality is such a powerful way and a unique way to show the truth of the situation from your vantage point, right? So what's the truth? How are we going to dress up that truth or strip the veneer off of that truth? I love that. I love that. You know where else I find a lot of things suck? I'd love to get your opinion on this. How come so many calls to action and button text just suck? Yes. I, you know, that's, that's a pet peeve of mine. It's always, you know, call now or eat or, or schedule this, you know, I, that, you know, using, you can say so much in so, so little words. I can be a long winded person and, you know, talk, all the time and I can just write and be long winded. But the thing is this, some of the best copy is the shortest copy and the most memorable copy. And that's where folks kind of, you know, drop the ball on things where you can have that, like I said, that personality in a a CTA you can, and folks just completely, you know, forget about that. They're, Oh, I guess I just have to put click here. You know, they they just assume that they, you can have, you can do something a little different there. That's such a great way to dip that toe, right? To do that test like you were talking about. Make your buy buttons interesting. Make right. your the mouth of your funnel inviting. Don't just say, click here. Right. And we even know then- to click. It's a freaking button. What else are we going to do to it? We're going <laughs> to exactly. look at it or we're going to click it. Right. Like, you can hmm. just have click the, click the giant fucking button. That would cut through the noise. Yes. Yes, it would. Yes, it would. There you go. Free copywriting for all of us. <laughs> but 
click the fucking button on your button. But I, it, and most people will click the fucking button. I mean, I do what I'm told. So if the button <laughs> says click the fucking button, I'm gonna click it. Yeah, I'm not, see, I'm not. I'm like, no, you're, I'm not gonna click that. Fuck. <laughs> see, but different buyer types need. Mm-hmm. To that's why it's all an experiment based on what exactly. they need to hear from you and what you're communicating to them, right? And that's a, that's another thing too. Is a lot of folks, a lot you know, small businesses too, because either you know the resources are thin, or you know they don't have an in-house marketing team or copywriter. And most of the time, small businesses, it's it's a you know one person operation, or they have you know their their niece doing. Oh, my niece can yeah. do TikTok videos. She can do the you yeah. know the social media. And like she's not a professional you need no. a professional to do those things but it's like it's just m- most folks they they can solve a lot with a b testing copy mm-hmm. just having two you know if you're doing a landing page have two separate landing page pages set up you know have one going for you know one month with certain kind of copy have another one going and just see yeah. you know which is getting more clicks what you know like we were saying earlier about the you know click the fucking button you can have one that says click here and then have one that says click the fucking button and then see yeah it performs better With and the i data and I that's guarantee- readily available it doesn't have to be that's the other thing like i think from my experience in software a lot of people hear a b testing and they're like that's going to be so expensive no mm-hmm. it's freaking not clone right. a page change some copy that's free right. take your email list cut it in half yep send it half to this person half to that person use the analytics that's provided by your web provider or your system by your email whatever it may be look at the click rate click rate versus click rate it's apples to apples right it doesn't have to be complicated it doesn't have to be expensive it doesn't also have to be in one day people are like well well i'm gonna run this a b test for an hour Really? And it's especially if you're running a small business, you might not even get any clicks in an hour. No, no, no. Especially if your button says click here. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, so we talked a little bit about pain points. We talked about voice. We talked about the buttons. What other just crimes of copywriting are you just tired of seeing? Oh, geez. You're opening up a can of worms. Yup. Yep, I'm cutting out that soapbox. I've made it out of wood <laughs> and I'm laying it at your feet, Lane. Go I down. Just, it's kind of like folks get inspired by certain brands and then they think that they can write just like that brand. It's almost like it's 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 pretty much like cre- like stealing some content. You know, I mentioned mm-hmm. earlier like Slim Jim, okay? Mm-hmm. You know, a few years ago they really, you know, made it big especially on social um, you know, Tapping into that, you know, uh, Gen Z male demo with a lot of, you know, meme content. Yeah. And then a lot of other brands kind of follow suit with yeah. that. And it failed because they're, you know, they're not, if you're going to copy someone else, you know, talking about copy, if you're going to copy someone else's yeah. copy, um, it, it, most likely it's not going to work. You know, you, you can only strike gold once with that kind of stuff. You have to learn how to create your own brand voice. You figure out who you are, what makes you different. Don't try to copy someone else. I mean, it, it, I, I like to use like, like the boy band kind of thing, you know, like in the nineties, I know we're talking about always sunny later, but I'm going to talk about boy bands right now. Let's it's talk like, about you know, boy bands. <laughs> but it's like every, you know, the Lou Pearlman model, which is yes. asshole. Yes. The Lou Pearlman model was just reproduce the same shit yes. using different guys yes. and the same type of music. And let's see if they, you know, if they all stick to the wall and become successful. And, you know, there was only really two who that became successful out of that, which was, you know, that's 98 whole- degrees. It wasn't you. Right. You're all, well, well, he, they were, re- they were with Perlman. I'm just talking right. about. With Perlman. No, but it's thinking Backstreet Boys. <laughs> right. Like, do I have a cute blonde? Do I have an edgy one? Do right. I have someone who's likely to wind up in rehab? Right. I love the parody, which became like a real thing. The uh, together, the mm-hmm. from MTV. That was brilliant because it yep. just completely, it made it, you know, made fun of that whole manufacturing kind of thing. And, you know, tying that back to copy, it's like, you can't just reproduce something else, you know, somebody else's kind of style. You got to create your own. Right. Because that's exactly, I mean, I love that you brought up 
the Perlman mentality and all of the stuff that happened with that because we saw in adulthood how those men have struggled to still carve identities outside of that box. And Mm -hmm. one of the things that always comes up for me is Howie. Howie was originally supposed to be the front man because Howie had the best voice. And then they found Brian and they put Brian in front. And so (laughs) Howie's like, I guess I'm the nothing. And still to this day, (laughs) Howie, who is arguably the most talented is always in the back because he's like, well, if I come to the front, people will be like, what the hell is Howie doing here? And that is because they (laughs) took a framework, put a bunch of dudes into it, locked Mm -hmm. them into it, and and also kind of Spice Girl persona them out. Like, you're the sporty one, you're the cute one, you're the weird one, you're the sexy one, go. Right. Using the same formula. Yes, using the exact same Mm -hmm. formula. And I see that all the time in copy where I feel like I can see the forensics underneath the copy. I go to the landing page and I'm like, that's an Amy Porterfield trick. That's a copy hacker's trick. That's a this, that's a that. That's a Russ Rafino. That's a Jeff Walker. That's a this, that's a that. Yep. Not that these things aren't valid. The strategies are super valid. That's why mm-hmm. they're all around. But when you take the language so tightly, the strategy loses all efficacy. Another, another, well, I'm going to open up another, well, not, oh, well, the, the, the can of worms has already been opened. Oh, up. it's open. It's, it's open. Been, We're I, opening all the cans. I, yeah, just and I, the cans. I, I see this a lot in, in legal marketing and it, and it does have its place. I can't say I'm, I'm anti this, what I'm going to say, but I see a lot of SEO keyword stuffing and uh. that completely can take personality out of you know, out of a landing page, out of a blog, you know, if you're doing it properly, great. No one can recognize that. But even, you know, even my mother who's 67 years old, didn't grow up, you know, online, doesn't really know jack shit, has her little Chromebook and looks up recipes. She can read a, you know, a a landing page and say like, this doesn't read well because it's just stuff with keywords like Orlando attorney in Orlando can help you with your Orlando case. Like it doesn't, It's it doesn't like, we get well. it, boo. We're you're in Orlando. <laughs> That's all you've successfully told us. Congratulations exactly. on ranking on page two of Orlando Attorneys. You have successfully told me nothing. I mean, I've read entire books like that too. It's not just an SEO thing. We yeah. we get dependent on what we think our industry needs to hear from us and the words they want to hear. I've read entire sales books that are just like this buzzword, this buzzword, this buzzword, this platitude, this platitude. And I just get so mad. I'm like, say something. Mm -hmm. Even if I disagree with you, give me the pleasure of disagreeing with you because I have something to disagree with, for God's sake. Right. You know, for, for me, so my background a little bit, I, I graduated from, from art school and then I went for my MBA and I'm an MBA dropout art school graduate. I'm very proud of saying that. Yay! Um, <laughs> um, but there's a, there's something about when folks use, you know, the SEO stuff, you know, stuffing SEO keywords or, you know, you know, saying like certain buzzwords, it's almost like they're, they're taking the artistry out of copywriting. And there, there is an art to it. You know, folks think, oh, writing for business. No, no art to it there. You know, we have to have, you know, be, you know, to second page of Google, that second page of Google actually sucks, but we got to be first page. <laughs> have to be on this if you're on second page of google you might as well be on last page of google you know right right. um but it's like there's still some kind of there's artistry with with writing and you can be creative and you know you you, there's a you you can do that even in you know more you know professional clients like i said earlier one of the main concerns complaints fears I've heard from people in my decade of serving small businesses. They're like, well, I'm not a writer, right? It's the same thing. as like, I'm not a salesperson. Okay, well, let me help you. And I will treat, teach you how to become the salesperson that you want to be. Right. What do you say to the people out there right now that are going, well, I'm not a writer. I don't have a strong personality. I'm not very interesting. I can't write my own copy. I mean, what I say to them first off is cool. Hire someone. That's exactly what I was going to (laughs) say. It took the words right out of my mouth. There we go. Hire someone. Hire someone. Just make, even if you have to budget it, 
hire someone. I guarantee, I mean, I'm not just saying this because, you know, you know, that writing is my bread and butter, but it can help your business so much. If you just Mm -hmm. hire folks who are good at what they do. I mean, Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm not good at sales. My dad was great at sales. He had his own business for, for 40 plus years. He was a great salesman, terrible at marketing though. Yeah. So you need to have that kind of, you know, even if they're, you know, contracted out, even if they're, you know, full-time employees, it doesn't matter. Just having that, that arsenal of folks who, you know, like we're talking about boy bands earlier, the cute one. If you have, you know, an SEO guy, you know, a copywriter, (laughs) dude, you know, you need to have that kind of like, yeah. you know, fantastic four or, you know, Avengers kind of squad to help your small business grow. I love that. I, because <laughs> number one, it's so true. And also what I've seen both in my own experience as a copywriter, but also having worked with copywriters and watching my clients progress, a brilliant, genius, beautiful copywriter will teach you how to write better copy by just delivering what you ask for. Mm -hmm. And they may not sit there and go, okay, Annie, notice what I did here. They may not go line by line and say, this is why I picked this adjective or this is why this buy button says click the fucking button. They may not be that granular with you. That's not their job. But if you look at what they deliver to you and you look at how it moves and positively manipulates you, you will become a better writer. Right. That's why, you know, with folks that, you know, Um, you know, contractors or whomever, you know, doing work for me, that's what I've been like learning how to do is, you know, how to give that constructive criticism and how to give, you know, proper guidance instead of, you know, I, you know, in my early days in agencies and, you know, when I was in in an undergrad and stuff, you don't want to be, you know, you don't want to work under someone who's just going to rewrite all of your shit. Like you're not going to learn anything from that. You know, but you will learn from someone who, you know, you know, shows you not rewrites it, but shows you line by line saying like, you can add a joke here. You could do this here. You can change this word and it changes just by that kind of guidance. That is so good. That is excellent to do by rewriting someone else's stuff. Nah, you can't. They're not going to learn anything. What's the best way to find someone who will jibe with your personality well what's the best way to say this is the kind of writing I'm looking for maybe if you don't know oh that's a hard question uh I mean usually when it it comes to it I usually give someone like an example of you know my style of you know my style of writing or Mm -hmm. something that I did for a previous client and you say you know this is something that you could do for this client because it's you know similar personality wise um sorry I, i've got the the, the the thing on my screen now. oh my god okay y'all can't see and this, um, this is hysterical so i've been a big white blob this whole time and now the sun has found lane and they are just gone i'm very ethereal right now it, it's true it's we bring it out in each other my dear what can i say <laughs> But no, I I think that's totally true. It's like, look for samples, ask for samples, bring Mm -hmm. samples. And that's the thing. A lot of folks, they, you know, they'll, you know, take on a project or whatever, you know, as a, you know, contractor and they'll just, you know, just, I'll just do it. And then they, they don't ask questions, always ask questions. People are afraid to ask questions. People are afraid to ask questions to clients. People are afraid to ask questions to, you know, their creative director. Why are people afraid to ask questions? That that's, that's my question. Why are people afraid to ask questions? That's a damn good question. (laughs) Honestly, how are we going to expect to get answers if we don't ask any damn questions? Mm -hmm. And you can save so much time too. And money. If you ask the right questions right from the get go, you can save so much time. And I mean, time, so stereotypical time is money. It time is. is money, especially if you're in a small business, you don't have time to, you know, you're trying to juggle your life. You know, m- maybe you have kids, maybe you have, you know, uh, you know, hobbies that you like to enjoy. You want to focus on those things too, while maintaining your business. You don't have time to, you know, go through several rounds of edits just because someone, you know, didn't have, you know, the balls to be like, oh, I got to ask, you know, I'm I'm too proud to ask a question. Yep. And it cuts down on that back and forth and back and forth and back and forth that both sides dread. Ask the question, get the clarity, cut right through that. 
Yes. Oh. Cut through the noise. And that's, and, and that's all tying back to, you know, copywriting. How, you know, how can you cut through the noise of, you know, how other folks are, you know, how they're marketing themselves. And like I said, it's not copying what everybody else is doing. You're not going to cut through the noise that way. You're just going to look like, uh, I'm going to use a phrase from, from the 90s. You're just going to look like a poser. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, haven't heard that word in a while. We're just going all the way back to the way back. Talking about Backstreet Boys and NSYNC and posers. Um, <laughs> I feel like I should be wearing my grade school plaid right now. But I, say, you can tell, I was like, the audience can, the, uh, the listeners can know uh, what decade I came from. <laughs> same, sibling, same. I mean, <laughs> my God. But I also brought you here for an ulterior motive, which we've already a little bit mentioned. Mm. Lane, what does any of this have to do with the proprietors of Patty's Pub? <laughs> So I'm a massive fan of Always Sunny. I, I think a lot of it has to do with it debuted when I moved to Philadelphia for, for college. So, <laughs> so I lived in Philly. I lived in Philly for like six and a half years. And I, I absolutely love Philly. I have a Liberty Bell tattoo on my arm. It's I'm a massive Phillies fan, massive Eagles fan. Um, they The gang has great ideas. They have excellent business ideas. I mean, Frank, you know, as a businessman, yeah, yeah. We're there. they have excellent ideas. You know, you're talking about kitten mittens, kitten mittens. Uh, wolf cola. Uh, we won't talk about when they were in the pyramid scheme. That's that's another thing. I don't want to get on. Wolf cola. <laughs> but the thing is, they don't listen. No, they don't listen to the folks that, you know, who give them advice on how to market these things. No. They're too, you know, they're, they're too proud of their ideas and they think that they can do it all on their own and they can't. <laughs> and it just turns into obviously, you know, comedy ensues. Ha ha ha. I mean, that's totally true. And in, in the later seasons, when Glenn Howerton is off filming AP bio and a million other things, they bring Mindy Kaling on for like a second. Mm -hmm. as a business advisor and they proceed now some of her ideas are great some of her ideas are horrible but they do exactly what you just said they like bring her up they build her up as this advisor and then they just don't do anything she says right and that's nothing right and that's the thing with with you know businesses like you can you know small business you can hire a consultant and spend you know a lot of coin on a consultant and you you they can you know try to teach you things, but if you're not going to implement those, you know, what they said, it's just a waste of money. It's a total waste of money, right? It's like, I've also seen people that, you know, you deliver really, really beautiful copy for them and they freaking love it. And then they freak themselves out and you go to that site a week later and their old copies back up. And oh, you're like, that's, what are you doing? And then I have seen that. What? I've and experienced that. It's so maddening. You're like, wait, 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 wait. We were at the finish line and you turned around and ran the other direction. What mm-hmm. are you doing? And yeah. that's and that's the thing too. It's like sometimes, you know, on the marketing side, I, you know, I've been at agencies where the client was right all the time. And that's not good. You need to tell your client creative direction. If they're hiring a creative agency or they're hiring a, you know, creative team to do, you know, work on their social or do landing pages or web, you know, website redesign, whatever, you have to take what their advice is. You you should, they're, you know, the creative team is, they're the, we're the experts here. Listen to the experts. And the artists, right? You used the word artistry about copywriting before. You are hiring an artist. You would not commission a portrait painter of great renown, get the portrait of you, and then let your kid crayon on top of it. That would be a really weird, very expensive, stupid thing to do. (laughs) But see, that's the thing. And I would say in the last 10 years, folks think that they can do it all. You know, folks think that they can, you know, write copy. They can, you know, because we have, you know, apps. I, now I sound like an old man because we have things like <laughs> you know, we have things like Canva where, you know, graphic designers are getting eliminated from their positions. You know, it's why would a small business hire a graphic designer and, you know, pay them 
whatever, 60, a hundred, a hundred dollars an hour to do something where they're like, well, I could do it on Canva, you know? So there's that kind of attitude too. And, and I've, I've found that as well with copies, like, oh, I, any, anybody can write. Cause I, you know, I did book reports in school. <laughs> That's hysterical. <laughs> Today I read to kill a mockingbird by Harper Lee. And that's how some of the copy reads. Amen. You know, I'm so glad that you brought up the way that we write like grade school, because here's something that I see all the time in copy that drives me nuts. We bury the lead like we're writing a five paragraph essay. So Mm -hmm. like we start the paragraph, we start the landing page, we start the email. And then in about five or six or seven or 10 or 52 sentences, we finally get to the damn point. And I think that that is very much because of today I read a book called To Kill a Mockingbird. And the fifth or 17th sentence is Atticus Finch is an interesting individual. Okay, just start there. I know, I know you're a fan of, uh, of fake statistics. Oh so this, God. Yes. So, oh. so this is, this is like a fake stat. It's like, I think it's, you know, I'm just going to pull this out of my ass, but it's like, I think, you know, maybe it's like 75% of the population completely, you know, after the first sentence, if you don't hook them right away, they're done. They're not gonna even going to read it anymore. It's probably maybe 80%. Like I said, pull the figure out of my ass. But that's what I do most of the time when I'm <laughs> editing sales copy. Yep. Is I'm going, this sentence needs to go to the top. That's like the first thing I always do is I'm like, you got there. Let's start there. Right. Right. You don't want to be too salesy. People hate that. You know, you don't want to be too salesy. So then that people are like, oh, shit. Well, I I don't want to be too salesy, but how can I put it, you know, you know, in the first sentence? How can I do that? And that's why I'm like, well, that's why I got to hire a professional copywriter to help you out. You know, Mm hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Get a Mr. Miyagi of copywriting. Yes. I always said, I, I, I've always described myself as the Meryl Streep of copywriting. That's, you know, I, yes. and, 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 you know, I, I've done work for, you know, like right now I'm working with, with law firms. I wrote, you know, uh, articles under a pseudonym for an adult entertainment magazine. Yeah. I've done uh, yes. <laughs> you know, people don't go to porn uh, websites for the articles, but I did some articles for, for a porn. I mean, they still got to be there. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, and I've, you know, done, you know, work for manly liquor brands and, you know, gruff, you know, stuff, you know, geared towards a, you know, more red blooded kind of GOP kind of, you know, audience. And that's not me. I'm this, you know, short little trans guy from, from, you know, grew up in new England. That's not me, <laughs> but I can write for that audience. Yeah. Um, so, you know, even though like I'm able to do that and, you know, switch, switch voices and, you know, that takes a lot of practice. So, but for a small business owner, if they decide that they want to, you know, do their own writing, work on your own voice and figure that out. Because once you have that, well, that's all you need. You don't need to, if you're not going into copywriting, you don't need to learn how to write for, you know, whiskey brands or, you know, porn magazines. You don't need to do that. You (laughs) you know how to write for yourself. You get to write for fun things. My freaking copywriting experience were like, why don't you write something for this freaking app about parking like you at least got to write for porn and whiskey (laughs) well i i started so i started my professional writing career um during like the blog heyday of you know the the mid aughts and you know i was doing food like fast food reviews and those were always like with like a comedic edge to them so i've i've always had that kind of create creativity. And yeah, I've worked with, you know, some of the, you know, some of the more boring stuff, but like I said, I always try to put some, you know, personality into it. Doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be always, you know, boring. I just, I just love that. And, you know, I love that we're talking a little bit about Sunny today too, because we're talking about voice and personality and style. If you're watching an episode of Sunny, if you took the visuals away, you would still, if you listen to it as an audio play, you would still know that you're watching an episode of Sunny. The oh, music, yeah. the way that it is, the dialogue, and mm-hmm. also the recurring jokes, right? They're hitting their big things. There's this really fabulous episode 
I love that I'm talking about this on a business podcast lane, but here we go. There's a fabulous episode in that same era. I think it's actually the same episode I was just talking about with Minnie Kaling, where Mac buys a sex doll of Dennis because he misses right. him. And the doll starts talking to all of them because they know what Dennis would say. And even if it's just calling D a bird, they they know what Dennis would say. That's what I would love people to have in their writing is is one of the best compliments I've ever received. And I just got it last week is I had a client that reached out to me and said, I did exactly what I knew you would say. And I mean, and I said, what do you mean what you knew I would say? And it's like, well, I didn't have time to ask you. So in my head, I thought, what would Annie say? Mm-hmm. And I heard your answer. And I spoke to that. That's the kind of copy magic that I want people to experience. That's the kind of personality that I want people to have so that when they go out into the world, their clients really get to know them. Their Mm -hmm. prospects really get to choose them. Mm -hmm. Mm. Exactly. I like how you brought up the uh, the bird joke. That's that's one of my favorite uh, recurring jokes on the show. They're like, and it, it always comes up. They're like, "Is that actually funny?" And it's like, "Well, it's funny to us." <laughs> You're a bird. To, You're a bird. <laughs> Shut up, bird. Like that's not even a good joke. Shut up, bird. I think my favorite one was when they actually showed a bird. I forgot what episode that was. <laughs> <laughs> it was like an ostrich. They they were like going back in time or something. It's like, oh yeah, there, and they use like a, an ostrich. Oh, so good. Show's just pure joy. Pure, weird, unique, often very gross. And and see, and that's a show where they're not afraid to, you know, push the envelope. Yeah. And going back, you know, I'm not saying be like always sunny with your with with you know your small <laughs> business copy. <laughs> that's the thing. It's like you can push the envelope a little bit. Just try it. Dip a toe in it. Dip dip a toe in those waters. So I have two more questions for you. The first question is, I have just handed you the contract. You don't have to submit for it. You don't have to try. It's already yours. I have handed you the contract for an always sunny in Philadelphia offshoot business to write all of their copy. What product of theirs do you choose? And can you give us a little teaser of what it might include? Oh, oh, this is a good one. Mm -hmm. I would probably have to say Wolf Cola. I think Wolf Cola has, even more than kitten mittens, I think Wolf Cola actually has potential as a brand. Okay. Um, I mean, it I is see- the choice of Boca, of what they think is Boca Raton, but actually winds up being Boca <laughs> Ram. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's got legs. Yeah, it's got legs. You know, I, you know, think about a decade ago when there was the, uh, the energy drink boom. Yep. It's like there's a, you know, thousands of energy drinks flood with, with Wolf Cola. You just need to find your audience who that, you know, define your audience market to that audience, write copy that can touch that audience. So I'm so good, touch that audience. <laughs> that's a, now that's like more of like, now I'm like talking like, um, um, shit, what's his, uh, Charlie and, uh, and his, uh, creepy uncle thing, but that's, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but, um, but if you, you know, like, like I've worked with brands prior that, you know, th- that it's a product in a flooded marketplace. I've done a lot of, um, wine and spirits marketing and, you know, branding, creating brands from the, you know, ground up, there are hundreds, thousands of whiskeys and vodkas. It's just trying to find what makes you unique, what makes your product unique, because your product's not going to be consumed by every single person. You're, you know, a lot of people have these grandiose ideas and they say that, you know, what do you want your brand to, you know, be, be like, and they say like, well, Coca-Cola, it's for everybody. You're not going to be Coca-Cola. It's, it's, it's better to be more niche. Um, and that's why I think Wolf Cola would have, it has the most legs out of all of the, uh, the ideas and brand ideas that the gang has had. Just because if, you know, if you create that specific audience and find out who they are and speak to them, you can become successful. You won't be as big as Coca-Cola, 
but you would have a following. You would have, you know, folks that would, you know, be fans of your brand and have that kind of like, you know, feel close to that brand because it speaks to them. And that fosters repeat business. Yeah. I love it. All right. Philly's own. Philly's, <laughs> well, temporarily Philly's own. Six years of Philly's own. Yes. Liberty Bell tattooed. Yes. And I brought up the Orlando thing. Yes. And the boy bands. And I it's just said, I guess it, it's, uh, it's affected me living in Orlando. <laughs> We have been on such a glorious romp all through copywriting and pop culture. Lane, I know my audience is going to want to get in touch with you. What is the best way for them to start a conversation with you? Folks can uh, hit me up on my website. It's uh, klanecrawford.com. Easy to remember. Um, I also um, am very active on Instagram. Uh, that's, uh, at the pocket tomboy. That's kind of like my alter ego Best of name in the <sighs> world. If that doesn't say the value of Lane's copywriting pocket tomboy is the best Instagram. That's a funny story about how I decided to like brand my kind of Instagram persona and fashion and, you know, just queer shit. Um, there was a show on logo years ago. Um, it's actually, it was called a big gay sketch show. That's where Kate McKinnon got her start. It was like her first kind of, you know, foray yeah. into, you know, sketch comedy and everything. Now we know how, you know, big and brilliant she is, but there was a, a sketch. It was called my pocket lesbian. And it was like about a little lesbian that you can keep in your pocket. And I figured, well, I'm pocket size. Cause I'm only five feet, you know, me pocket too, me too. yeah. Yeah, my friend Octavio in college used to call me Pocket Pixie Passanisi, which I always enjoyed. So <laughs> from my pocket to your pocket or whatever pocket we happen to be in that day, Lane, it has been such a delight talking to you. I this can't wait great. to do it again. Clearly, we have more pop culture things to discuss. Oh, of course. Thank you so much for bringing your unique brand of Sparkle to our show. Thank you. Thank you for calling it Sparkle. Oh, hell yes. Everybody else, I will be back in just a second with my final thoughts and your homework for the week. Well, hey there, listeners. I initially titled this episode on personality, noise, and it's always sunny. But as its air date approached, I decided to cut through my own noise and excess and go straight to the point. This episode was truly all about writing and listening. Lane dropped so many gems in this episode. Your homework could really go in any number of directions, like A-B testing, button copy, hiring a dang copywriter already. But instead, I want you to liberate yourself from all your old, stale copy. Liberate may seem like a strong, ridiculous word here, but whenever I walk my clients through this process, they walk away feeling lighter than air. Here's what I want you to do. Go read your website, your bio, your book draft, whatever, out loud as if reading it to a friend. And here's the kicker. Without your own judgment, get excited about what you're reading. But stop and highlight anything that feels forced, unclear, buzzwordy, word salady, or most importantly, just not like you. Your prospects don't want to read a remix of your main competitors. They've likely already been there and done that. Nor do they want you to focus on all the wins and none of the pains. The transformation you offer is enticing, but it may feel inaccessible if you don't write out the full path in truth and detail. Your task is simple but profound. Replace all the areas you highlighted with one of two voices, yours or your ideal prospect's. Speak your truth or your best stab at theirs. Use your words, your sass, your humor, your style, or direct quotes from your clients, with permission, of course. Paint the picture of the emotional world the hurdle your prospect faces has trapped them in. Coax them with encouragement and coaching that speaks to their heart. And then, and only then, you'll have a website, book, or blurb that will truly rise above the noise. And don't forget, if you find all this way too overwhelming, there is no shame in hiring a genius just like Lane. To 
Legitimate to Quit is brought to you by the non sleazy Sales Academy and me, Annie P. Ruggles. What if you never had to sell alone again? If you always felt safe and seen and supported in selling situations because you only had to show up as your best and also most ordinary self. You can profit just by being you without one gimmick, one inch of sleaze. To find out more about our membership, visit www.nonsleazy.com. That's N-O-N-S-L-E-A-Z-Y dot com. Too Legitimate to Quit is written and hosted by me, Annie Pastanisi Ruggles. Our editor and producer is Andrew Sims of Hypable. Our incredible earworm of a theme tune was composed and performed by Riley Horbasio. Our beautiful show art is by Francois Vigno. And my beautiful, wonderful, amazing creative director, Georgia Curran, handles my social media accounts with care. Listen, I would love to hear from you. I'd love to hear how your homework is going, what you think of the show, or what topics you'd love to see covered here. Feel free to reach out to me on any platform with messaging, but the best for me are LinkedIn, where you'll find me under my name, Annie P. Ruggles, or on Instagram, where you'll find me at Anniepreneur. And please don't forget to send this show to people that you think would benefit or to drop us a review wherever you listen to podcasts that really helps our show grow. Until next week, remember, you're too legit to quit.